Hi everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter, and now that finals are finally over, I can go into the video for April 2019 in paleontology. A new paper was published looking at the Tanis site from North America. This newly found site has the potential to be one of the most important paleontological sites in the history of the science. The paper argues that a siege was created by the impact that killed the non-avian dinosaurs 66 million years ago and that the deposit here at Tanis is a part of that siege. A siege is when you have a harmonic wave going across a small body of water or a bay. As an example, something like the wind could push all the water in a lake to one side, and then once that wind stops, it'll harmonize back and forth, and eventually it will stop, but that back and forth motion is what is called the siege. There are a few different pieces of evidence for this some of which are the fish that were found in the formation along with some petrified logs, and second, the layers of sediment that are covering those fish. The fish in petrified logs seem to line up with the flow of water, meaning that the siege could have pushed up onto land and then drawn back out, forcing all the fish into that singular column and pattern. The second indication would be layers of sediment above those fish that are significantly different than those that the fish are held in, meaning that these sediments could have been brought in when the water came back in. While the fish come from fresh water areas, there are also ammonites, which are exclusively marine, found in this, meaning that the siege, if it was a bay or something, could have brought in some of these ammonites and they could have become fossilized with these fish as well. Other evidence suggesting that this is very close to the KPG boundary includes what could be impact glass from some of the pieces of earth that were shot up into the atmosphere and melted by the impact of the meteor. These seem to have fallen back down into the Tanis site and into some of the gills of some of the fish that lived during the time. This makes it potentially very likely that this deposit could have been laid down in just a few hours after the impact. The site does, however, need much further examination. As it's on private land, it hasn't been fully accessible to a great multitude of scientists in order to fully study every aspect of the deposit. And we're going to need a lot more specific study on the sedimentation to make sure that the two layers of different rock between the fish and the not fish layers have significant differences that are because of a siege and not because of natural environments such as just rising water levels. While the site is on private land, the Field Museum in Chicago did do a prospecting run there and did take a block of some of these fish fossils back to their museum. So while those are getting prepped out, we will have some secondary information from other scientists in order to help us better understand exactly what went on in the Tanis deposit. And again, this is really exciting, but we need to be careful about it because there's a lot of really bold claims and we just need more scientists to be able to do the research on the site and the fossils from the site in order to get a better understanding of what exactly did happen. A new species of fossil crab has been discovered being called Calicamera perplexa, and it was a very bizarre looking crab. With massive eyes and multiple legs that had turned into paddles for swimming, it was one of the first ocean-going crabs, and potentially even more so than our modern day ocean-going crabs, which while having paddles, they aren't nearly as pronounced as these ones. This crab came from North and South America while the continents were still separated during the Cretaceous, and it shows a lot of features that are very similar to the larval forms of many crabs, showing how some of these larval stages can get more and more pronounced and longer in order to help animals survive in certain environments, and how even the young can really push evolution to entirely new directions. The newly discovered Simba Kubwa Kotok Africa is potentially the largest mammalian predator to ever live. A hyenodont, it wasn't very closely related to any of today's modern mammal predators, including the hyenas, which are more distantly related. Some of the estimates for the size of Simba Kubwa have put it at a larger size than that of a polar bear, the largest mammal predator that we know of today. However, a lot of other estimates have put it much more in line with our modern day predators, such as the lions and tigers. Part of the discrepancy for these size estimate differences is the very fragmentary nature of the find, with only a few bones being found, including that of a jawbone. While that jawbone has been used to try and estimate the size of Simba Kuba, 
it's hard to make it a direct comparison to our modern day mammal predators, simply due to the different skull structures that the hyenodonts had compared to our modern day animals. Hadrosaurs were known for their strange skulls, but before the hadrosaurs were things like the iguanodonts, which had much more simple shaped skulls. A good intermediary of these two groups would be something like the newly discovered Gobihadros mongoliensis, which has many very good preservation features, including a very nearly perfect skull. Gobihadros shows a lot of the very unique transitional characteristics between the iguanodontians and the hadrosaurs, such as having the shorter forelimbs of the hadrosaurs, which lets them browse easier, versus still having the thumb spikes of the iguanodontians. Additionally, it also had the start of an expanded nasal cavity compared to other more primitive species, showing how that it might have evolved into the forms that we see like Parasaurolophus with the massive nasal crests that we know. The Permian extinction was bad, so bad that I've already made a video on a lot of the causes of it. However, there's still new causes being added, and they very much reminisce with what's happening today. Mercury poisoning seemed to have had a very major effect during the seas at the end Permian extinction. A lot of this mercury probably came from the basalt traps that were erupting in Siberia. And once that entered the ocean, it became toxic for a lot of life. This mirrors today, where even for human consumption, some fish are having warnings put out because of the content of mercury that's being found inside of them. And a lot of this mercury is coming from human caused activity, specifically in the mining industry. So that's something that we need to watch out for in order to help prevent extinctions in the future. Pachycetus is one of the earliest known whales coming from Pakistan. It, with its relative Ambulocetus, helped give us a very good window into the early evolution of whales. Because of this, the Middle East, and particularly Pakistan, have been seen as one of the most important places for whale evolution. However, that might be a little bit more spread out now. A new Peruvian fossil, Paragocetus pacificus, coming from just a few million years after Pachycetus, shows us that the early whales crossed the planet very, very quickly. And so their full evolution into the much more aquatic forms we know today may have happened across the entire planet. Paragocetus was still very primitive. Living on land, it still had the hoof tips on each of its fingers in order to walk across the land, much like some of the very early, early horses did. While relatives of Pachycetus, like Indohyus, do show that the first whales most likely came from Southern Asia, their full evolution into the modern forms we know today may have happened everywhere, and Paragocetus shows that. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. Sorry this one's late, finals, visiting family, lots of things going on, so apologize. Gonna be moving up to Flagstaff for university, going to NAU, because they have a paleo program. So that'll be exciting. They also have Petrified Forest out there and Northern Arizona Museum of Natural History. So I'm gonna try and get involved with one of those. Look for your own local museums as well, you guys, if you are interested. They are almost always looking for volunteers. So if you wanna get involved, that is a great way to do it. And with that in mind, everyone, take care, be safe, don't go extinct.